So let's take a look at the wide world of C construction assembly. And I got the last project for this class written and up. And um, what happened is you must use Server 2016. I'm going to get rid of Server 2008 the next time I teach this class, which might be as soon as next semester. The schedule is not yet determined. But in any case, I'm getting rid of 2008 and because it's getting too old. And in particular, um, the my, it used to be that to compile C, let me get rid of this, to compile C on um, Windows, you had to install Visual Studio, which is four and a half gigabytes and takes an hour or more to put on, is very annoying. And now I found Microsoft has a new command line only version that should be smaller. And it's smaller, it's only 1.2 gigabytes. But anyway, that's small by Microsoft standards. And um, when you put that on, you can only run it, however, on something later than Server 2008. So um, I put it on Server 2016. So let me just say a word about the projects. Uh, these are the last uh, official required projects in the class because I've hit the number that I intended. In fact, one more. And um, anything after this will be extra credit. There we are. All right. So, anyway, um, so there's the last three projects. We'll cover them tonight. This is where you set up Server 2016 and then start compiling C and then start disassembling your compiled stuff to see how it looks in assembly, which is the issue in this, this week's chapter, um, how to spot C constructs in assembly. And logically, this stuff should be up around here, like 8, 9, and 10, but I didn't have it ready at that time because the previous... My previous attempts to do this project have been very, very miserable because of Visual, uh, Microsoft Visual, Visual Studio, which is so painful to install and get working. This latest one seems to be pretty good as long as you use a modern version of Windows. So we'll see. Anyway, um, and for a while I was thinking I would actually go to a non-Microsoft product, but I'd really rather avoid that because, especially in this malware analysis class, we really want to see how Windows software works in its original state. We don't really need to see other kinds of C compilers. We want to see the ones that actually go to the API and all that. So I'd really rather use the official Microsoft development environment if we can do it without too much suffering. And so this seems like a pretty reasonable thing in that direction. We'll see how well it works out when the students get it. One thing that almost always happens is everything works for me and then a bunch of students get stuck doing things I did not expect. There aren't very many slides. I'm probably just going to demonstrate all this stuff. Um, so. There are different things you can do in assembly. So let me just set up a couple of these. I'll just go through them live. It's probably what I'm going to do and just come back to the slides when necessary. So after you install this Visual C++ thing, you get this thing. Um, Visual Studio Installer finishes, and then you get a launch button for Visual Studio Installer. And this gives you the com Visual Studio command prompt. And the, in here, you don't have GCC. You have CL for compile and link. And that's essentially the same thing as GCC. And it has various options. So now you can create things. So I'm doing, I'm following a tutorial. So I went and made a folder called hello. And then in here, I put in a file called hello.cpp. We're technically not writing C, we're writing C++. Although the difference is not important for what we're doing here. The only difference is uh, the include file at the top is IO stream instead of stdio.h. There's Lots of cool features of C++, but we're not using any of them. So uh, we open it with Notepad, um, hello.cpp, and there is my glorious, let me make that font bigger, format font, uh, big would be good. All right, there is my glorious C++ program. This is Hello World. You include IO stream using nameplace standard. That's all one command, and that is what replaces include stdio.h. Um, if you study C++, you'll find out why the namespace has to be there, which I forget. But anyway, that's the boilerplate at the top. And down here, this is how you print things out if you want to use C out, the console out routine. You just send it a string and then send it an end line, which is a character turn, line feed. And there you have it. This will print hello world. So you can compile it. And let me bring up, this is the um, first project here. Good, it's actually moving. All right. So you compile it here with um, CL slash EHSC. And you can do CL slash help and find out what that stands for, but I didn't even bother to do that. I, I'm lazy bomb. I just want normal compiling, and for some reason, all those switches are what they recommend for normal compiling, and I wasn't interested enough to figure out why. 
I'm willing to regard it as a magic invocation for this point of view, like GCC. So this will compile the C++, and it will make an object file and link it into an executable file and create hello.exe. So now you can run hello.exe, and it says hello world. So that's not very exciting, but it does give us C and a C compiler that works. And now we have executable code. We can analyze it with IDA. Now, there are two free versions of IDA. In my Server 2008, I've installed the older free version of IDA. But here, I'm, I might as well put on the newer free version of IDA, which does 64-bit code. It's a 64-bit machine, so it will work. So you'll find at the start of this project, the instructions, the start of uh, one of these projects, the second one, yeah. Um, project 18 is the one that explicitly demonstrates what we're doing here. So put on IDA Pro Free. It's very easy. Just go to this page, and there's a Windows, Linux, and Mac version. So download the Linux version, Windows version and just install it. It's easy. And it's very much like the older version of IDA, except it's laid out a little bit nicer. And supposedly, it works on 64-bit code. A message it contained made me think it did not work on 32-bit code, but it seems to work on the code I feed it. So uh, it seems to be working fine. So um, let's disassemble Hello World. So if I bring up IDA. No results for IDA. This is Microsoft for you. There's a shortcut on the desktop, but Microsoft can't find it because Microsoft is a very strange company. So anyway, um, the idea of a search function can't find something on the desktop or in the start menu or anywhere. It's right in front it's, of your nose, which you it's been that, It's been that way since Windows XP when Bill Gates announced he was going to make a search engine better than Google, and he brought up Bing, and the whole world laughed because he said, you can't even find a shortcut in my own shortcuts for me. <laughs> and they still can't. Anyway, um, so. It's a, you wonder what they're thinking up there, but anyway, um, so new. Remember, you don't. If you load a file, you'd be loading a previously disassembled file. Here, I'm going to open a new file, and it's going to figure it out. So I put that thing in C hello, and there it is, hello. So now it's going to guess what it is and say it looks like a portable executable. And I said that sounds pretty good to me. So let's interpret it as a portable executable, and analyze it, and off it goes. The bar at the top turns blue pretty fast. It only took it a few seconds to finish analyzing it. And as always, the code is this big, and it dumped me at the thing named start, which is technically where the code starts and doesn't include any of the code I wrote. It's several modules away from anything I wrote and not apparently connected to it by any of these arrows or anything. So this is where you got the same old dance that you will get used to. Unless some student ever teaches me a better way to do this, this is the only way I know to find anything good in IDA, is view. Open subviews strings, which this version of IDA does not turn on by default, which is pretty annoying. And in the strings, you can find something I know about, like hello world. So wherever that is, that's the part of the code I want to see, not all this garbage created by the compiler or by Windows or something that I don't care about. So that takes you, double click that, you get to where the data is, the text data is stored in the R data section, storing the string hello world. So now you've got to go to the data x ref comment and point to that number to see the code that is using it. And when you hover over that number, it'll pop up a little box with the code. And when you double click that number, it'll bring the code up. And now we see just one box. And this is actually for good reason, because this incredibly simple program, it all fits in one box. This is the compilation of all the code I wrote, which was nothing but print hello world. So here's a string called hello world, which we just saw is someplace in the R data section. So it pushes the offset pointing to that into the stack. Then it pushes the offset to something else into the stack. And then it calls a function, which here just has a subroutine number. Uh, when I used uh, Visual Studio 2008 in the graphic version, it actually found that this was printf. Here, I'm not seen to be connecting in any useful way to C libraries or whatever Windows uses instead, the Windows API. It doesn't have C standard libraries. It has some Windows version of it instead. So this is apparently something that eventually turns into C out. But it doesn't tell me that here. But that's the point. And the point here is just to see what a function call is. You've seen this before. A function call is push, push, call, or push, 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 call. This is printing hello world and then um, carriage return. And there's going to be a format string or something. I don't know why there's three parameters here, but you have to know a little bit more about C out. I think it probably is one of them is probably the uh, number for the console. But I'm not really sure. Anyway, in general, all I care about here is this is what function calls look like. Push stuff onto the stack and then call a routine. 
and it will find the variables on the stack. And when you're moving strings, you push a pointer to the stack, and the pointer points to the string. All right, so that's the simplest case, and let's try a few others. So that's, we can do the printf now. Let's, I don't think it's worth highlighting, I'll just see you. That's what printf looks like if you print a number and then a text. And if you look at it in Ida Pro and go through the same process, it'll push hello, then two, then the format string. That's why there are three parameters here. It always puts them in reverse order because it wants the stack reverses the order. So you push them on in reverse order. Then when the function gets there, it will find this one first, that one first, and that one first. Because remember, the stack is last in, first out. So the last in here was the format string, so it'll be the first out. And if you're taking the 127, we have a jolly time with the format string. If you forget to put in the format string, you can do all sorts of nasty things. I just did uh, some of the Pico CTF, and it seems like almost all the advanced ones are format strings this time. So several, I did a few, a few of them. It seems more boring than usual. But anyway, um, there are some format strings that are kind of fun. Anyway, so all right, so that's one issue, is how function calls work and the order in which parameters. Then there's the difference between global variables and local variables. If you haven't done any programming, um, you might want to get used to this. So you can define a variable here, like int l equals 3. That's a local variable, which means it won't even exist until you enter this routine. It will be stored on the stack frame for this routine, and when you exit this routine, it will be thrown away. It exists only between the curly braces. It's a temporary variable. This is the most common type of variable. Most of the time, you only want a variable to exist while one routine is running, and then you throw it away. But you might have something you want to be global, accessible to every routine, and then you put it up here. You define it outside all the curly braces, and that means it's stored somewhere else, like in the data segment or something. It might even be in the text segment. I think it can be in different places. Um, but the main point is it is not on the stack at all. No pushing or popping of the stack causes it to stop vanishing. It's just stored somewhere else. So it can be equal to, and it'll be true for the whole thing. And this is commonly where you put something like a debug flag or something for your code. Anyway, so that's a global variable, and that's a local variable. And they look very different in assembler, of course. Local variables are on the stack. So they will have an address like ebp plus var4, some displacement from the base pointer. That's on the stack. So this is a local variable based on EBP, and remember EBP changes when you enter the routine, and when you leave, EBP is restored to the previous value, and all those stack values are lost. And the other one is here, dword 41 b 1000 just an address somewhere else where it's stored. And Ida Pro doesn't have any symbols for most code, so it will just make up a name, and the name will just be the address where it is, and perhaps something here to tell you what data type it is. So it's apparently a double word. Um, is the size of it, but it's at that address. So that's a variable that goes in ECX, and then you push it. This one on the stack, you put it in EAX, and then you push it, push, push, call. That's how they're ready to print it. You push pointers to strings and other things on the stack, and then you call. So that has the previous stuff, too, push, push, call, call a function. And here it has the difference between local and global variables, which is a thing to be aware of. Uh, arithmetic operations, you've got them all, of course. You've got addition and subtraction and multiplication. You have integer division, and you have floating point division. Uh, and these are all in assembly code now. When I started in the old days, there was no multiplication, no division. You have to write your own routines. But the modern processor has them. And so you'll see, here it is. I put three in one variable and six in the other. So here they go. Both of them are local variables on the stack. Here I am putting them in registers and then adding them. It has to use a couple routines to do this. And we talked about this before. Um, What's one line of C might take several assembly language instructions, and if this was ARM, it would take even more. Because ARM has to do all the math on registers. You have to take everything, put it in registers, add them, and put it all back in RAM. Here you can do some things directly. Like I could add the thing on the stack directly to EX. Anyway, then take EX and put it back on the stack. So it took three commands to add two numbers and put it on another variable. And here I subtract something. And here I multiply integer, integer multiply something, and all this mess is floating point division, which of course is pretty complicated because you have a decimal point and extra bits, and then when you're done, you have things rolling over, overflow, and underflow. It uses several registers, and it's pretty complicated, pretty advanced stuff. And I don't really care about all the details of it, but I just can spot it when you see it. Here's multiplication, and there's division. 
And that's as far as I usually go, because I'm usually looking for a piece of code that does something like reveal the password or something. I'm not really trying to understand exactly how all the math worked. If I wanted to understand the math for a thing like this, I would use Hopper and decompile it and get it back to C, <laughs> rather than trying to read anything that complicated in Assembler. Hopper has a pretty good decompiler that will create pseudocode in C. And there may be other ones. What's that? Is Hopper free? Hopper has a free trial version, which is pretty good, and then a pay version. And the pay version is quite cheap. So I'll demonstrate it in 127. We'll use it a bit. And I'm looking for better decompilers, yeah? $99. $99, yeah, for the commercial version. But even if you don't pay, you can use it, and all it does is like uh, make you restart it every hour or something. Yes. So it's not too bad. And it, so um, then you've got ifs. So suppose I have an if statement. I equals 3. If i is greater than 0, print that. Else print that. So that's an if statement. And of course, if you go find the strings and come back, you will find, of course, three boxes in Ida. You have something here, it goes ends in a compare and then jump less than or equal, which is what if is. You load things around, then you compare something to zero. If it is less than zero, it'll go one way. If it's less than equal, greater than zero, it'll go the other way. So one way it prints i is positive, the other way it prints i is not positive. That's, that's what if statements look like. They're very easy to spot because they're three boxes. And uh, then there are four loops. This is every, uh, every language makes up its own version of making for loops, which is a really, really bad idea because there's a ton of security vulnerabilities that come from being off by one, doing it one time too many or one time too few. So I really wish, if anybody had ever bothered to ask me, something people frequently fail to do, I would have told them to stick with basic. There's this long dead language called basic that went for i equals one, two, ten, print i. Next I. I liked that. That was real simple. You never knew, you never had a problem knowing how many times it was going to go, but this is gone. Instead, you have this hogwash. So, how many times is that going to print? Any idea? 100. Is it 100? Is it 101? Is it 99? Uh, I think this one's actually 100. You start at zero, you make it less than 100, so it won't do 100. It will start at zero. This is what kind of pervert thinks you should start at zero when you're counting? Anyway. Um, and Python just continues to make it stupid. Go you know, from 1 to 5 means it goes from 1 to 4, but not 5, just to break your heart. Anyway, so that's the game. That's how for loops are. You have a starting condition. You have a condition. It will continue until this condition is no longer true, and then a condition done every time, which could be incrementing it. And it's very general, and you can make very complicated things quickly and make them very baffling. Um, there's a certain kind of coder that loves to make everything incredibly compact. Like, there's a way to make loops that's nothing but punctuation marks and ifs that's nothing but punctuation marks. And, you know, there's some people think this is awesomely cool, and people like me hate you for doing this. Because I went through my years of being clever, and then I worked in business and finance, where they said, look, it has to be right, it has to be easy to read. And I said, oh, I never thought of that. And they said, yeah, don't do it some goofy way. Do it so everybody can quickly see exactly what it did, and then they can check it. And I said, oh, yeah, that's another whole idea. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. I think Python also has a similar statement like that. No, it it's doesn't. It has, yeah, but it has 4i. Python says 4i in range 0, colon 4. 0, comma 4. And that will go 0, 1, 2, and 3, but not 4. And you're just supposed to know that because they hate you. Just like everybody that writes these things. Whoever writes computer languages, they're all too smart. Except Microsoft, they write like PowerShell, which they're the people who care about business. You would think they would make that easy. I've looked at PowerShell loops. Maybe they're Less baffling. Anyway, the end result is people often get it wrong. But that's the game. So now you have, those are your four components. Um, you actually, you have the initialization, the comparison, the increment or decrement, and here's what gets executed, whatever's in those curly braces. Every time it passes the condition, it does that thing once. So here's what it looks like in assembly. You initialize it here by loading something zero into the variable. Then you increment it here, adding 1 to that stuff and putting it back on the stack. It takes three commands to do it. You have to take the value off the stack, put it in a register, add 1 to the register, and then take the register and put it back on the stack. Then you got to compare it. So you have to compare this to the end, 64H, because just to break your heart, of course, it's using hexadecimal, so 100 is 64. Um, and now you do jump greater than equal here. So under certain conditions, it will jump down to 102F, 
which is here. On other conditions, it won't. And on you go. That's the game. It'll print this thing. Um, I don't see the loop, actually. 102F. It's below. Yeah, down here's the jump. Okay, so this is actually kind of not obvious at all. I expected it to jump back here, but what it does is it, this is what it's going to do when the loop is over. No. Uh, no, greater than or equal. It's going to, yes, it's going to, you know, when it's, the loop is over, it's going to jump down here. Otherwise, it's going to move this. It prints something every time. That's right. Every time it prints something. But how does it exit? It jumps down to 102F. 102F is off the bottom. OK, right. OK, so it prints this every time. And this jump is the clue. And it'll jump off the screen when it's over. OK, fair enough. And there are many, many different ways to do this. You could do it with jump less, jump less than equal. You could put the pieces in different spots. You know, And that's up to your compiler, which just decides which way to do it. And when they change the version of the compiler, all those decisions will change. So you can't really trust what assembly code is going to look like in detail. You get the general idea. Then there are arrays. You can define a five character array, which is, of course, numbered 0 through 4. And you put the values here. Then you have an integer. And then you copy um, that data into these two arrays. This will put i into the local array. And this will put i into the global array. So you've got um, in the code. It's going to fill it with zeros here. I'll put zero in um, a location. Then it's going to go incrementing here, comparing things here to decide when to do it. Here it's going to put stuff in B. And here it's putting stuff in A. So notice up here, it's putting it on in, I think, global EBP plus a calculated location. This is what an array looks like. You have EBP, then you're incrementing onto the stack, then you're jumping by fours, because you have to move four bytes at a time. Because remember, data is used 32 bits at a time in words, but it's addressed eight bits at a time in bytes. So you jump by fours here to go through it. And down here, you do the same thing, jumping by fours. But instead of starting at EBP, you start from a named location, because this is in the data section or something. This is a global variable. So you should be able to spot that as you look at it. The, the obvious things are the difference between local and global, whether it's based on the base pointer or not. And this jumping by four is very common for any kind of large data copy. All right. So here's, here's things we talked about. If you want to find the code in the assembler, the way I like to do it is go to strings, find a string you can read, double click it, and then click, double click the XREF number. And you will finally find the code that actually uses that string. There may be some other way. But for some unknown reason, Ida never puts you to the right place when you start. It always shows you garbage that's not worth looking at. Um, function calls, you'll see push, push, and then call. The arguments go on in reverse order, so they will come off in the forward order. You have global variables and local variables. Global variables will show a memory address. Local variables will show a stack address, calculated from EBP or less commonly from ESP. Arithmetic. Typically, you put the variables in the register, do the arithmetic in the registers, and then put it back in the variables. This is the way you must always do it on ARM. In Intel, it's sometimes some of these can be combined into a single instruction. And branching, um, you're going to do some kind of compare, which is usually compare or test, then some kind of conditional jump, jump 0, jump not 0, jump less than or equal, one of those things. And then you'll see arrows, red arrow for false and green arrow for true. All right. I got a few cahoots about that stuff. And that's really all I got. It's not very complicated today, but it uh, did turn into three projects. So doing it takes a little while, even with the new, uh, less abusive Microsoft compiler. Uh, Microsoft's idea of making something easy is still not all that easy. So what variables are on the stack? OK, local variables on the stack. Good. All right, what C construct is three boxes connected by arrows. OK, good. Fast. Half of them are wrong, but they're fast. Anyways, that's fine. <laughs> uh, but the most popular answer is correct anyway. It's if. That's why you have three boxes. All right, what construct is several push commands followed by a call? OK. That's calling a function. Good. All right. And 
Which one looks like that? D word 41B000. All right, that's a global variable. This gives you an address where it's stored, so uh, I will just record these winners. All right, so uh, I'm just going to clean up and go up to the lab, and I'll be there if anybody wants to work on projects up there. Uh, that's enough for today. We'll do it again next week.